Before we look at the other method for determining whether a compound is chiral or achiral, I wanted to say a word about symmetry because symmetry is going to be key to this other method. Molecules or compounds that are achiral have reflection symmetry, but we can identify another kind of symmetry in many organic molecules, rotational symmetry, and trans-1,2-dimethylcyclohexane, this compound right here with two methyl groups, one pointing up and one pointing down, adjacent to each other on a cyclohexane ring, has a rotational axis of symmetry, but as we'll see, is chiral. We can prove it's chiral by doing what we just did with the fail-safe or brute force method. Reflecting this compound through the plane of the screen generates this mirror image. Notice the upper methyl has been reflected into a downward position and the lower pointing methyl has been pointed into an upward position in the mirror image. And these are not the same. And again, this is worth pausing, trying to rotate this. If you do this rotation, if you do this rotation, you'll see that these are not perfectly superimposable. These are not the same, and as such, this compound is chiral, and this is the enantiomer of that compound. So, it's a chiral compound, but it does have rotational symmetry, right? If we take the original molecule and we imagine rotating the molecule about this axis in red, 180 degrees, well, that's going to move this upward pointing methyl down into a position behind the plane of the screen exactly where this other methyl group is sitting. And this rotation is going to move this downward pointing methyl group up into an upward pointing position exactly where this other methyl group is sitting. So after this rotation, we get a structure that looks identical to the original. This is what we mean by rotational symmetry. Now, as neat as that may seem, and despite the implications for the methyl groups, this means that the methyl groups are highly, highly, highly similar. They're in essentially identical chemical environments. Rotational symmetry has nothing to do with chirality. Chirality has to do with reflection symmetry, or the lack thereof, not rotational symmetry. And this is worth keeping in mind, because you'll start to notice these symmetry elements, these rotational symmetry elements in a number of chiral compounds. The compound's still chiral, even if it has that rotational symmetry, because chirality is all about this, all about the fact that reflecting the molecule through a plane generates a structure that is not the same as the original. Now, the cis isomer, cis-1,2-dimethylcyclohexane, where now the two methyl groups are on the same side of the six-membered ring, cis-1,2-dimethylcyclohexane is achiral, and it has reflection symmetry. And here by reflection symmetry, we mean we can draw a plane internal to the molecule, reflection through which generates a structure that is exactly identical to the original with no rotation, no moving of the molecules at all. In cis-1,2-dimethylcyclohexane, the plane of symmetry is right here, perpendicular to the screen and cutting right through the middle of the molecule like this, right between the two methyl groups. Reflection through this plane is going to move this methyl group where the other methyl group is sitting, and it's going to move this methyl group where this methyl group is sitting, and it's going to move these top three carbons down to the bottom, and the bottom three carbons up to the top. We've got perfect reflection symmetry in this structure. So upon that reflection, we get a structure that is identical to the original. In other words, this compound has reflection symmetry. Therefore, it is achiral. Any compound with reflection symmetry like this, any compound in possession of a plane of symmetry, is achiral. But an interesting thing to note about this partic these two particular examples is that this compound is not the same as this. Right, trans-1,2-dimethylcyclohexane is a stereoisomer of cis-1,2-dimethylcyclohexane. This means that these two carbons, both in the trans isomer and in the cis isomer, are stereocenters, right? They're stereogenic centers. If we exchange the methyl and implied hydrogen at one or at one of these carbons, I should say, we get an isomer of the original structure. So they're both stereocenters. Despite the presence of these tetrahedral stereocenters, though, the cis isomer is achiral. And we proved that by recognizing the reflection symmetry. Compounds that have two or more stereocenters, but are nonetheless achiral because the groups at the stereocenters are sort of symmetrically disposed, like these methyl groups, these are known as meso. 
compounds. And meso compounds are the reason I don't love the term chiral center or chirality center. These stereocenters are, are stereocenters, but they're not, but the molecule as a whole is not chiral. So the presence of a so-called chirality center or chiral center in a molecule is not sufficient evidence to show that the compound or the molecule is chiral. This has two so-called chiral centers, but is nonetheless achiral overall due to its reflection symmetry. But that's a bit of a side rant. The important point here is that if we've got multiple stereocenters in a molecule, but they're symmetrically disposed such that the molecule as a whole is achiral, we've got a meso compound on our hands. The ideas on the last slide lead us to an idea for determining chirality called the plane of symmetry test. And the idea here is we look for a plane of reflection symmetry in the molecular structure. This is more efficient than drawing the mirror image, arguably, but you got to kind of train your eye to recognize and spot and be very careful about planes of symmetry. A compound that has a plane of symmetry, or what we'll call a center of inversion symmetry, we'll talk, touch on that in a second, in any of its conformations is achiral. Any one conformation. As long as you can find one conformation with a plane of symmetry, the compound is achiral. A compound that lacks those symmetry elements in all conformations is chiral. Now, we'll come to planes of symmetry in a second with this example at the bottom of the slide, but I wanted to touch on inversion as well. The inversion operation is kind of like reflection through a point. You define a point at the center of the molecular structure, and you send all atoms and groups in the structure through that central point. So we take this methyl group, for example, and we send it through that point and out the other side at an equal distance in three dimensions. Notice this operation would move this methyl from above the plane through the center, which is in the plane of the screen, and below the plane to the other side. So this operation would exchange the methyls. And in this particular molecule, inversion would exchange all the corresponding atoms, nitrogen to nitrogen, carbonyl to carbonyl. So after the inversion, the resulting structure looks exactly like the original, which is pretty cool. This inversion operation has left the appearance of the molecule completely unchanged. And actually, in compounds with this inversion symmetry, that's an achiral compound. So compounds with inversion symmetry are achiral. Now, many of these have conformations that contain planes of symmetry anyway, so this isn't super important to recognize. And in sophomore level courses, sometimes you never deal with inversion symmetry at all, but it is an interesting point, particularly if you go on and take more advanced organic chemistry courses where you may come across compounds like this that actually lack reflection symmetry but have this inversion symmetry. All right, let's practice with the plane of symmetry test by drawing all the possible stereoisomers of this compound here. Now, this compound has two stereocenters. I'm going to highlight them. And so to draw all the possible stereoisomers, we're going to draw all possible configurations at those two stereocenters. So one option, for example, is to have both of the hydroxyls up, like so. We could have both of the hydroxyls down is an option. However, this structure is identical to the both of the hydroxyls up structure we just drew. These two are two different viewpoints of the same molecule. And it's worth pausing and verifying if that's tough for you to see. But I'm going to erase this one and go to the next one. A third option is to have, say, the left-hand hydroxyl down and the right-hand hydroxyl up. And a fourth option is to have that left-hand hydroxyl up and the right-hand hydroxyl down, like so. Now, this is a good moment to verify that actually these last two structures we drew are not equivalent to each other. These are not the same. Pause the video to verify that if you need to. Now, what we're going to do is identify whether each of these is chiral or achiral. And let's start with that first isomer we drew, which has both of the hydroxyl groups pointed up. So here, and again, just to be crystal clear here, we can draw in the implied hydrogens here and here. And we can notice that there is a plane of symmetry in this molecule that runs right down the middle, vertical, 
a plane sort of perpendicular to the screen. There's a plane of symmetry in this molecule right here. And that plane exchanges the two hydroxyl groups and exchanges the two hydrogens and exchanges the methyl groups and exchanges the stereogenic carbons. Essentially, it moves the left half of the molecule into the right half and the right half into the left half. Recognizing this plane of symmetry is sufficient evidence to conclude that the compound is a chiral. This is despite the fact that there are chiral conformations of this molecule. For example, an equivalent way we could have drawn the molecule is like this, but then rotating around the central CC bond, we could have put the hydroxyl group here and the methyl group out. This is identical to, this is the same compound as the one on the left. These are just conformational isomers, different conformers of the compound. Just, and, and this particular conformer, for, if you look at it, is chiral, is chiral. This particular conformer lacks a plane of symmetry, does not have a plane of symmetry. But we found one conformation with a plane of symmetry, therefore the compound as a whole is a chiral. Now, in the next case here, we have the configuration changed at the left-hand carbon. I'm going to go ahead and draw in these implied hydrogens as well. Now we certainly don't have this plane of symmetry that we had previously, since reflection through a vertical plane like this would move, for example, this hydrogen where this hydroxyl group is sitting. So reflection through that plane would change the appearance of the molecule. So that's not a plane of symmetry. And in fact, if we tried to line things up to achieve a plane of symmetry, we would find we'd be unable to do so. For example, if I rotated this around, trying to get the hydroxyl group pointed out towards you, that would swing the H down here. This would swing the OH where we want and or need it. And that would put the methyl group in the back. Here again, though, the vertical plane is still not a plane of symmetry. While the hydroxyl groups would reflect right, the methyl group would reflect into a hydrogen, and this hydrogen would reflect back into to this methyl group if I tried to reflect this way. So reflection would change the appearance of the molecule. So going back to the original conformation that we drew here, it becomes apparent that there is no plane of symmetry in this molecule. There's no reflection plane that leaves the appearance of the molecule completely unchanged. That makes this compound a chiral compound. This is a bit tricky to see. We got to acknowledge that you have to really try to look for an achiral conformation, and this sometimes involves considering rotations around bonds. I'm going to use a little trick for the third molecule and erase the implied hydrogens to make this a little bit more clear. We've already concluded that this molecule is chiral. This molecule is the enantiomer of this. It is the mirror image generated by reflecting through a plane perpendicular to the screen like this, and that's worth verifying on your own. In fact, let's draw in that mirror plane just to make this crystal clear. Reflecting through a mirror at this position would generate the structure on the right. So these two are enantiomers of each other. But we already verified, we already concluded that the structure in the middle is chiral. The mirror image of a chiral molecule is its enantiomer, and the enantiomer is necessarily chiral, right? If your right hand is chiral, your left hand is also chiral. So logically, we can conclude that this compound is also chiral. And the reason I took this shortcut is because you could go through the exact same analysis we did with this molecule with this one, and you'd come to the same conclusion. Those two molecules are chiral because they lack a plane of symmetry. They lack a conformation with reflection symmetry in it. All four of the structures on this slide are achiral, and our task here is to find the plane of symmetry in each achiral structure. I actually want to start with the bottom left structure because I think this is the one with a plane of symmetry that jumps out most easily. Generally, when you're looking for planes of symmetry, you want to make sure to orient the plane so that what I call corresponding groups are on either side. So for example, in this cyclopropane, we've got two methyl groups. The plane has to come right between those two methyl groups so that reflection moves one methyl into the other and vice versa. So our plane of symmetry is going to have to be something like this. So that's sort of my first candidate plane 
right here. We can also verify that this plane of symmetry does not alter the positions of any other groups, right? This reflection through this plane would turn this carbon to that carbon and actually would leave the CH2 group up here that's in the plane completely untouched. So there is a, a CH2 group here, and though I'm not doing a great job of showing it, those two H's and the carbon there at the top of the cyclopropane ring would be in this plane of symmetry. And so this blue plane perpendicular to the screen cutting right through the middle of the cyclopropane ring is a plane of symmetry in this molecule. Similar things going on with the top left case where there is a plane that includes these two carbons perpendicular to the screen, includes the chlorine, carbon-chlorine bond, includes the carbon-bromine bond, includes the carbon-methyl bond up here, and this carbon-methyl bond. All four, well, all six of these atoms really uh, lie in a common plane. And reflection through that plane would move this C2H4 fragment to this one and would move this C2H4 fragment to this one. And so reflection through this plane, which I'm going to attempt to draw kind of at an angle, would leave the appearance of the molecule completely unchanged. So keep in mind here, it's mostly roughly perpendicular to the screen and it includes all those atoms that we've highlighted in blue. And just to make this a bit more clear, this side of the molecule is sort of to the left of the plane, if you like, or a bit above the screen. And the right-hand side of the molecule is below the plane, so to speak. Let's look at the bottom right case. Bottom right case is actually similar to the practice problem we did on the previous slide. The only difference is I've tacked on an extra carbon on either of these carbon chains. That leads to this structure right here. And for the exact same reason, as we concluded on the previous slide, this is um, an achiral structure with a plane of symmetry cutting right through the middle of it right here. One important point about this compound is it does have two stereocenters, right? It's got tetrahedral stereocenters there and there, and so with two stereocenters that are symmetrically disposed like this, it's a meso compound. Two stereocenters, but still achiral. All right, and in the last case, again, with the corresponding groups idea, we can recognize that the plane of symmetry is going to have to be right between these chlorines. It's also going to need to include all the carbons of the bridge, which there are three carbons there, so three points to find a plane, so we can do that. But it needs to include the bridge because there's no corresponding CH2 group to this one carbon bridge, right? So the, the plane of symmetry is going to need to include these three carbons. It's actually also going to need to include the implied hydrogens at these carbons in the front and in the back like this. So I'm actually going to draw those in and highlight those as well since those are also in the plane. And again, I'm going to do my best here to draw the plane. It's roughly perpendicular to the screen, more or less, and it includes all of these atoms that we've highlighted in blue, and it bisects the, it comes right between the two chlorines. So this chlorine kind of you can imagine is sort of to the right or, or slightly above the plane, right? And this chlorine on the left is slightly below or to the left of this plane that's more or less perpendicular to the screen. So each of these structures is achiral because of these planes of symmetry that we drew. And the plane of symmetry method is a very attractive approach for determining chirality because we don't have to draw any mirror images, rotate any molecules necessarily. That said, you do need to think about conformation in many cases and sometimes I think it's helpful to actually change the, your view of the molecule, actually redraw the molecule in a way that makes the symmetry more clear to your eyes.